All right, well, let's get started. Welcome, everybody, and good evening. And uh, welcome to the 30th annual meeting of the Randolph Area Community Development Corporation. We're excited to be holding our meeting in this brand new common area here at the Randolph House, one of the many housing communities managed by RACDC. And I'm glad to see so many familiar and friendly faces in the audience. Uh, I'd like to especially welcome residents of Randolph House who are here. Uh, Senator Mark McDonald joined us, uh, Representative Larry Satkowitz, uh, a number of our funders and financial friends in the housing world. So uh, welcome, everybody. We all know that housing is a critical issue across Vermont and the rest of the country. And RACDC has been steadily working towards alleviating the housing pressures in our community. At the same time, we strive to address many of the associated factors that can cause housing stress, working with area partners such as Gifford Healthcare, Capstone Community Action, and Clara Martin Center to provide additional support to our residents and the wider community. During the past year, we completed the renovation of this facility, and while it did not add any units, the 48 apartments here now have upgraded utilities, improved common areas, and a critical second elevator. Our work on Salisbury Square is getting even closer to the first shovel in the ground, and we're evaluating other projects that could add significant new housing stock in Randolph. We continue to support our downtown businesses through our designated downtown program and had a successful, if somewhat damp, First Friday series this year. It's an honor for me to serve on our active board, and I thank our dedicated staff and board for all their efforts. It's a big job. I also note with sadness the passing of longtime board member and past president Pam Stafford, who we lost this summer, and the retirement of our, one of our founding members, Pat French, who will be honored a bit later in the program. Our meeting tonight will begin with a brief business session and several votes. And I remind you that anyone who has made a financial contribution to RACDC during the past three years is considered a voting member. We will then move to the presentation of some well-deserved awards and conclude with remarks from our keynote speaker, Julie Campoli. So, I call the official business meeting to order, and our first task is to approve the minutes from 2022's meeting, which are included in your little flyer here. Uh, so I would look for a motion for approval of last year's minutes. So moved. So moved, Tim Caulfield. Second? Second. Sam Second for Sam Hooper. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Minutes are approved. That was easy. So the second item of business is our treasurer's report, which I will cover. Uh, I'll try not to get too much into the accounting weeds here, but uh, there, are, there are a few complexities this year to report. RACDC's financial year ended June 30th, 2023 reflects continued financial strength and also a number of structural changes to our financials due to mainly to the Randolph House rehab and related limited partnership, recent occasion and government grants. So if that's not a mouthful, uh, it's a lot of regulation that we have to follow. As general partner, we, are now, we now fully consolidate Randolph House into the RACDC financial statements and with the approximate $6 million investment in Randolph House, our combined net assets have doubled from $5 million to just over $10 million. Due to some federal requirements, we will also be changing our fiscal year from June 30th to December 31st. And as a result, we are currently in a short six-month transition period, which will require an additional audit at the end of uh, the July-December period. Financials for 2024 and beyond will then be on a calendar year basis, which complies with a lot of the funding that we have. Our 2023 operating revenues, shown in the left side here, were, were down about 10% versus 2022, due mainly to some timing of project management fees, uh, but the day-to-day -day business continues to be pretty much on track. Uh, expenses were also down slightly, with the overall result being basically break-even, with revenues and expenses each at about $1.5 million. We operate on a pretty tight budget, and certainly value 
and thank you for the many financial contributions we receive, including continued free office space from Bar Harbor Bank. So with that, I'll pause for any questions anyone has on the financial report. Yes? Um, Peter, since you mentioned contributions, what, what uh, is your typical year's uh, income from contributions? We can't see that in the Yes. Numbers. Normally, our, our range is somewhere between forty dollars and $60,000. So we don't, we don't rely heavily on contributions, but they really make a big impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, I would look for a motion to approve the treasurer's report. I'll move. Bob Wright. Second. Second from Christine Maloney. All right, any other comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, treasurer's report is approved. All right. Our nominating report, the last piece of our business. We, we have a volunteer board, and again, I thank them for all their service. I will also mention that we are always on the lookout for new board and committee members. So if you have a passion for housing and community building, please reach out. We will put you to work. This year, we have three nominations for renewed three-year terms for the following board members. Christine Maloney, Dan Bennett, and Sam Hooper. Additionally, I would entertain any nominations from the floor if there are any. There usually aren't. <laughs> All right. If there are no further nominations, I would look for a motion to approve the renomination of our three board members. So, quick question Is it yes. Dan Bennett or Dan DeVoe? It's Dan DeVoe. Dan DeVoe? Yeah, Bennett. Oh, it is Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> He's not going anywhere either. <laughs> <laughs> We're not letting you go. <laughs> Good Sorry about that. All right. Okay. So, motion to approve that. So moved. Tom Ayers, second. Second from Tim Caulfield. All in favor of the nominated candidates, please say aye. All right. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. They're thrilled to continue. Okay. So now we have a special tribute to our good friend Pat French, who basically was the backbone of this organization and previous organizations for many, many years, and I think finally said, it's time for me to retire from this. Uh, Pat was the, involved in the merger of Randolph's housing organizations uh, with RACDZ back in 1999, and I, I think he had served on the board ever since that time. Um, he served as our nominating chair. He did just about everything you could think of for RACDC and many other organizations in town. Uh, we honored him with a gift earlier this year, but we wanted to have a shout out to Pat for all the work he did and, and wish him well in his retirement. <clears throat> and now I will turn it over to Julie. Thanks, everybody. I'm Julie Ifland, Executive Director of RACDC. Welcome, and thank you all for coming. Um, our 30th anniversary is certainly a milestone, and we're really happy to share it with everyone. I um, want to thank Peter and the entire Board of Directors, who unfailingly are supportive, thoughtful in their guidance, and um, really generous with their time and their talents. And as RACDC grows, um, that becomes a more and more important um, guidance to have. Um, and so um, I'll reiterate Peter's uh, thought that we'd love to have others join us um, as we continue to try to keep this organization vital and growing. Uh, There's a lot of important work to do. Um, so um, I want to introduce you to our staff, the people who do the work of this organization, um, because they are extraordinary in their dedication and their good humor which is a required uh, quality. Um, Laura Di Piazza, 
relatively a new member of our team, the downtown program manager. She's really hit the ground running. She's promoting our downtown and our businesses in ways that are new and different. She's running events, cultivating collaboration among the organizations in town, and she's going to be spearheading um, a downtown placemaking project this coming year. Um, so stay tuned for that. We're really excited about that. This is a First Friday event. Um, that was not as wet, <laughs> so that's good. Okay, here you go. Ann Howard is our SASH coordinator. Oops, uh, down. Yeah, there we go. Our SASH coordinator. <laughs> SASH is for support and services at home. It's a wellness program for seniors eligible for Medicare, and we host this locally. It's free of charge to the seniors. And Ann and her team of colleagues help participants to set and achieve their own goals, so that they are in the driver's seat but they have some really great co-pilots to make sure that they stay on, on course. Now recently, the residents of this building got together of their own volition, on their own steam, and created care packages for seniors in Barrie who were affected by the flood. And then they jammed all the stuff in Anne's car and took it to Barrie, so, um, so her job description is varied. <laughs> um, Becky Wright, our Jocelyn House resident manager, who I think is here also, um, in fact, um, Laura is a uh, stand up or wave or something when I say your name, guys, because I'm not sure people. No, there's Laura. There we go. And Anne, there's Becky, right? Okay. And Anne's in back. Anne's in back. Um, so, Becky and Holly Pratt, our new kitchen manager, who I don't think is here, um, and a host of Jocelyn House service staff really keep that big old house on Hospital Hill a home for all who enter. Arlene is also here, who obviously had done that job for a lot longer. Um, but Becky also do doubles as a face painter at First Friday. So again, very versatile staff. Uh, next one, Marty Lira, um, who you saw at the registration table, is our um, this year's AmeriCorps member for RACDC. Um, she is here. This is a play. Um, and I stole Tim Calibro's photo of the play. Um, and um, it's a wonderful photo of them and Amy, Your Honor, who is um, our departing office manager. So we're losing these two fine uh, thespians and staff people uh, this year. But Mari um, hailed from Southern California. She arrived la last October and quickly learned a lot about Randolph and a lot about winter. <laughs> um, so despite the challenges of moving to a new and cold place, her ability to communicate and make friends easily really um, made her a wonderful ambassador for us and for the town. We call her the mayor of Randolph, and we are all going to miss her when she goes back home, for sure. And Amy, who's taking on a different challenge this year, has been our office manager, organizing, supporting us, always with a quick smile and frequently with a quick wit. She's still working with us part time, um, but we miss her already. And she's in the room too. Where's Amy? Amy, there she is in back. <laughs> Wayne Fontanella over here. Wayne does not like to have his picture taken, so we have really poor photos of him. But anyway, Wayne's our housing and property manager. He manages three of our properties and handles occupancy applications. He designed our first co post COVID event, which Again, we didn't get the picture right, but that was the Cornhole Festival downtown, our first foray after COVID. And he also finds time to help with First Friday when a tent needs to be erected or whatever. Uh, he's there to do it. Um, the folks at Stewart Property Manager who aren't management who aren't here tonight, but who manage this building, some of our other apartment buildings, also work really closely with our staff to make sure that the buildings and the people in them are well supported, safe and happy. And um, Nathan Johnston, our um, IT manager who is here. Oh, there he is, right? He's here. Uh, so um, Nathan keeps us one step ahead of the hackers. Uh, he finds a way for technology to help us do our jobs and to be uh, accomplish goals from community um, service kind of things like downtown Wi-Fi to digital information boards like the ones you see out here and in these um, lounges. And also, um, amazing things that we never knew you could do with light. <laughs> He's really great at it. This is from our, um, our floodplain forest light festival that we did a while back, and he's awesome with that. Diane Nelligan, who is also back there as our newest staff person, she's starting 
like she started last week, I think. Um, she's already working hard. Um, she's going to be working with us on housing development and compliance work. She's done some amazing project work in her career. And so we're really thrilled to have her. And then um, finally, Darlene Kelly, um, who um, also doesn't like to have her picture taken, uh, helps keep our increasingly com complex financial projects, loan funds, financial reporting on track. And she provides us with our office mascot and goodwill ambassador, Oliver. <laughs> so, so much of what we do requires a lot of perseverance, a lot of patience, a lot of heart. And I'm really grateful to work with people who have these quantities qualities in great quantities and so I want to please th uh, join me in thanking them for all they do. So I want to also welcome you to Randolph House. We're proud of this project to breathe some new life into the important community asset we have here. Even before the renovation this is kind of a nice place to, um, to live for seniors. It's right on Main Street, it's close to shops and services and dentists and physicians and pharmacies, it has sidewalks and public transit, right to the door, it has green spaces. But it was dated out of compliance uh, to both codes and norms. Um, community space was like a closet um, and there are like between 50 and 60 people living here on a regular basis. So it was really important that we bring this um, up to speed for another couple generations of seniors. So when we talk about housing projects, a lot of time we focus on the construction part, uh, and that is huge, right? It's a big part of what goes into these projects. Our funders are back there. They know they help us through the travails of getting funding and figuring all of the pieces out. So there was design and engineering studies. There was grant writing. There was contracting. There was supply chain woes. And there was, of course, COVID to work around. Um, but like most of what we do, whether it's constructing a building or holding an event, what we really do is about people. So I wanted to give you a little short story about a little known part of our Randolph House journey. And this is called Occupied Rehab. So Occupied Rehab refers to construction work on a building that people are still living in, but may have to leave for a little while. So when residents, yes, some of our residents are here and they're like, I could hear the groans already. <laughs> So when residents have to leave their homes during construction on a building funded with federal dollars, that's known as relocation covered by the Uniform Relocation Act. And it requires that we as the housing provider find other homes for the residents for that time. As a result, we need to figure out how to permanently or temporarily sorry, pack up and relocate over 50 seniors service animals, durable medical equipment and furnishings for between two and eight weeks during COVID and a housing shortage in a way that met head regulations and on the construction timeline. Some of the seniors were able to move in with family and friends for a while, but the rest of them, we had to find um, places to go. And actually, even for the people who moved in with family and friends, it was our job to make sure that where they were going was safe and affordable. So the closest hotels were 30 miles away and in service deserts for the most part there was no grocery store nearby there wasn't walking to services there was no another doctors or religious services were nearby um, so we had only one bulk housing option available to us so we scheduled a meeting and explained to our 70 80 90 year old residents that they were going to be dorm mates at vtc's old dorm share a bathroom, take meals in the cafeteria, and learn how to stream with Roku to watch TV. <laughs> Gones? No, no, good. So the Randolph House relocation made me love my coworkers. Not just like them, but love them. <laughs> because these brave and kind souls took an impossible situation and one that was found in no one's job description <laughs> and made it possible and even occasionally enjoyable. We planned every detail. We worked on weekends. We reached out for volunteers, rotary, theater, board members help, pack, unpack, made or brought meals when the cafeteria, who knew, goes, out of, uh, goes on vacation sometimes, um, troubleshot technology transfer, you name it. It took almost six months to relocate every floor moving one floor out the same day that the others moved back in. Our residents were not always happy about the situation, 
And for many of them, it was really a difficult thing to do. We made, did our best to make it comfortable, and they ultimately made the best of it. Living like college students, helping each other out, it was really kind of wonderful in the long run. It was eye-opening, but we now understand our residents and their lifestyle better than we ever did. And now they know they're tougher and younger at heart than they ever thought they were. <laughs> Are there nods from the residents? Are they the audience? Yeah, please, please. So we have two housing projects in our pipeline now that will rehab uh, together 25 uh, existing units and create close to 50 new units. Salisbury Square, um, we're hoping is scheduled to start construction next spring. We've got a lot of work to do this fall, but that's our target now. And we've been in conceptual design of a new project uh, involving occupied rehab of 25 existing apartments and the creation of 28 new units. Um, and we're taking away two really important lessons from our Randolph House journey. The first is that we're not building or renovating buildings. We're building and renovating homes. These homes are so important to people's lives and it's hard to be without them even for a little while. The second really important lesson we learned is that we should definitely time our retirement to start before the next relocation project. <laughs> Just kidding. So um, anyway, we all know there's a lot to do and a lot to celebrate, which is why we get together once a year to reflect, to have some fun along the way, and to thank people who keep this community ticking. So thanks um, once more for all your support and generosity. You really keep us all going. And um, we're, we're going to be enjoying handing out some some uh, well-deserved thanks uh, to some folks in the community tonight. So we should, um, shall we, yeah, should we adjourn the meeting first or keep, under, either, either way, it doesn't matter. Thank you. All right, so now we get to hopefully adjourn our business meeting. So I would look for a motion to adjourn the annual meeting. From Tom Ayers. Second? Second. Second from Christine. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now we'll move on to the, well, it's not that wasn't fun, but the, the entertainment portion. Um, so I'd like to uh, call on Bob Wright to come up and make an award presentation. Thanks. So I have a fun job tonight. This is the uh, annual uh, award that we give out every year. It's the Jim Hutchinson, or it's the Hutchinson Award, and, and, and it was inspired by Jim Hutchinson, the late Jim Hutchinson. Many of us know him, some don't, but he was a local uh, guy, spent a lot of time uh, uh, in volunteering, and, and that's why this award was created to honor his time so it it's not very hard to find a local person to award give this award when you have people like carol carol is a local business person as people know she's at the uh, uh frankenberg agency which she owns and and it's it's thriving it's, it's she's relocated it from a brick building beside the railroad tracks into a nice renovated building that uh so she's, she's uh, done a lot from the business community. She's very involved in, in the business. She's, she's a bi-local kind of a person. She really supports the local economy. Um, and it's a real pleasure to, to know her. So she works hard. I mean, you know, she told me the other day that uh, she doesn't know when she has time to work because she volunteers so much. <laughs> And I'll give you just a little list of, of, you know, some of the things that she gets involved with. Uh, she's been on the Gifford board. Uh, she's no longer on that board, but she was on that board for nine years. She's currently on the uh, Gifford Auxiliary Board, and she volunteers at the thrift stop. Uh, so um, she uh, also uh, is part of the Make-A-Wish uh, foundation. Uh, she does some fundraising for uh, the Make-A-Wish through a golf outing that uh, happens that uh, I think they raised 25 grand uh, to support the Make-A-Wish Foundation. 
Um, she spent <clears throat> a lot of time, uh, she's on the committee of, uh, for the Jocelyn House. We did a Jocelyn House uh, renovation, and a lot of you folks uh, were kind enough to, to donate to that fund. Uh, uh, but the Jocelyn House, as people know what kind of a place that is, uh, uh, Carol uh, was was a, a instrumental person to help, uh, you know, with th through the planning process of that, and as well as the fundraising. So we raised, uh, I don't know, close to four hundred and seventy thousand dollars, I think, for renovating uh, that facility and. Uh, it was another uh, live, uh, you know, work where you live, <laughs> occupied rehab. Um, but uh, so she's she's a giver, and you guys probably know that from uh, anybody that that knows her. Um, let me see if I've missed anything, Carol, because I don't want to. What's that? Yeah, she's she's been on the uh, uh, RACDC board. She was on that board for for three years and um, food shelf. She does, uh, uh, she's on the board of the food shelf and she actually helps out there. So she's oftentimes working. So she's not only uh, doing the planning stages, she's boots on the ground kind of a person. And people that know her uh, can really appreciate uh, Carol Bushy. So uh, Carol, I would like to present you with <clears throat> this year's Hutchinson Award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Say a few things. I really prefer to be in the background. <laughs> but um, I was a friend of Jim Hutchinson. We used to discuss politics. That was fun. <laughs> Um, I, I am a true believer in shopping local, supporting local businesses, local people, and nonprofits. Um, the people that have made me successful, I think it's fair to give back. Um, there's so many deserving people in our community that really deserve this award. So I'm really honored that you chose me. Thank you. We have another award. Thank you, Carol. Yes. Thank you, Bob. We have another award that's more recent, that's um, just three or four years old, that we call the Energy Rising Award. And um, the Energy Rising is, is to people who have done something not necessarily philanthropic, not necessarily typical, you know, um, typical work that, with a nonprofit, but somebody who's done something that really jump starts something in our community. Um, so 30 years ago, RACDC was actually created when 15 North Main Street burned to the ground. And the community at that time said, oh my gosh, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, it's hard to rebuild, but without it, what will we do? And so we rebuilt. Bell Mains occupied that for many years, um, along with Clara Martin on the second, third floors. And there was a similar feeling when the Winslows um, stopped their business in the first floor of that building and the community really viscerally felt that were we going to survive this? And um, <clears throat> George Kelly and Nathan Gray stepped in, bought the building, and they partnered with three business people who were the sort of the new anchors to this new idea of a kind of indoor mall, almost, because it was a very, very big space, probably too big for any local business. And it has made such an enormous difference. Not only are they quality businesses, but it's a quality renovation, and it just brings life back to that part of Main Street in a way that we couldn't ignore. And so we wanted to honor, um, we wanted to honor the, both of the Grays, um, who took the initiative and the risk to bring this place back to life, and the business owners who really make it sing. Um, so if they would come up here, I know um, George and Kelly are actually, I think, celebrating 
their anniversary too. Um, <laughs> so uh, that might take precedence over this. Um, but Nathan's here, so um, we just um, have something for the building. Nathan, this is um, Energy Rising Award. Thank you very much. And then we have something. One for each of you. Oh, boy. <laughs> and we have little certificates to thank you for oh, wow. all the work you've done. If you'd like to say well, something, thank please you do. Very much. And then also <laughs> Stephanie, third branch pottery, Stephanie Ooh. Tyler. Ooh. It's pottery. <laughs> it's pottery. Yes! <laughs> it's actually my favorite. <laughs> and Kelsey Wolf, I don't know if Kelsey's Mom. here. She wasn't able to make it tonight. And Matthew. <laughs> right, as well. So, anyway, thank you all. Yes. Thank and you. hope you'll stay with Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the intro, Julie. Um, it's been a long road, um, but. <laughs> Like you said, uh, having that much darkness in Main Street just didn't feel right. And I think Stephanie, Kelsey, and Matt, they've done an incredible job of bringing it back to life down there and kind of bringing the community back in town. So thank you very much. Yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I didn't, I'm awkward and I don't know what to say. <laughs> I never, but it's been, it's been amazing being on Main Street um, and just the community response is also just, it's been really, really great. There you go, Tim, there's a new quote. <laughs> Tim quoted me saying uh, empty bowls. Tim uh, interviewed me after we just did the empty bowls and the quote was, it was really, really cool. And so, <laughs> um, but yeah, but thank you everyone for, for this honor and for, for supporting us, too. It means a lot. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is your um Nathan? <laughs> Julie, did you were you able to get your stuff up on the Nathan? Julie, I know we do have a little. I just we have to make sure that your stuff can get up on the screen. Um, Nathan, did you use all the spots? Oh, right. I'm not sure what else has to happen. Maybe she can just step in tonight. So um, while the technology happens, I'll just say a few words about Julie Kim Holy, who we're very lucky to have tonight. Um, actually ran into Julie's work um, many moons ago when I started at um, at RACDC, um, and she was um, working with a lot of the housing organizations, a lot of the state agencies around here, trying to, um, and towns, trying to help us understand what density looked like and how, how downtowns work, and um, did some work, I think, on the early Salisbury Square um, designs. Um, she's a noted speaker, author, uh, and, and thinker about what makes um, infrastructure and solid things work with people. Um, so we're really um, hoping to get some inspiration, some ideas from her. Thank you. Um, well, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks to Julie for thinking of me. And um, I just want to uh, congratulate the award winners. It's really easy to show up and talk for an hour. But the real work here is done by people on the ground like Carol and Stephanie and the others that have put so many hours into making the place wonderful and caring. Um, I just tell stories about the people that are doing the work that you're doing. And I wouldn't be able to do what I do if it weren't for people like you. So let's give them another round of applause. Can you hear me? 
Okay, I will make sure that I will get very close there. to this. But I need my images first. <clears throat> Well done. Wow. Okay, it worked. I'm gonna hope they don't run out of power. I hope they don't run out of power. Would it be easy to wear something like this? Sure. So I should put it here. So I'm gonna be looking this way. Okay. Okay, let's start with the things that we love about Randolph, and there are many, many things to love about it. I, I actually um, have done a couple of different projects in Randolph. Um, and the first one I'll, I'll tell you about soon, but um, this was a 19, an image from the 1990s that Alex McLean took for our book, uh, Visualizing Density, and it was a prominent, is this thing working? I think I'm gonna just do this. Does this come out? All right, well, I'll just stand right here. I'm sorry, I have a soft voice. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's just talk about the great things first. The, um, what we call assets, I also call them good bones, uh, like so many Vermont villages. Uh, Randolph has got a very compact form, um, a great urban pattern. Um, it's a really walkable size. It's got a wonderful layout. <coughs> Basically, Route 12 comes through, which was the organizing corridor in the earliest years, and then the railroad came through, and all of the buildings lined up along those two corridors, which are not at a right angle, they're at um, an interesting angle, which makes a very interesting street pattern. And right at the intersection of those two spots is a real sweet spot, which I think of as the sort of physical center of town. And this kind of pattern makes it very walkable and very human scale and very comfortable. Um, there's a great sense of history in the buildings around the downtown. Uh, that late 1800s architecture that from the railroad era is on prominent display in both the downtown buildings and the, in the residential houses. Um, and it's been, for the most part, pretty well preserved and intact. And then alongside that, the industrial architecture that came along. I think I'm getting a little feedback from both of these, so I'm going to turn this off. The industrial architecture that, that came along with that railroad is also incredibly interesting, and it's, and it's a little bit con in contrast to the more formal um, commercial architecture of the day. And then you've got these wonderful gateways that are pretty common in most Vermont villages where you come into town and there's like this constricting of views, buildings that are set up very close to the street um, so that you're, whoops, so that you can't really see everything all at once. You get a sense of entry and then you, more is revealed as you enter through town. And a lot of um, the, the years that I've been watching Vermont villages, um, many of the buildings that are set close to the road, sometimes they will fall into disrepair and they get taken down. Sometimes they're, they're um, taken out because they're seen as some kind of a um, hazard. But I think that there's a lot lost when you do that because of that sense of, of gateway. And you get it on the other side of town on Route 12. As you're, as you're coming into town down the hill, it's green. And then these two buildings are very close to the road. And then it opens up into downtown. So it's a very... Uh, strong sense of arrival. You know you're in town when you're in town, and you know you're out of town when you're out of town. Um, there are really wonderful view corridors, and I noticed this the first time I came here to take pictures, that so many buildings are, pla are placed right at the end of a street, and they're often very attractive buildings, like the library. Um, so th they present this kind of terminal view from within um, the village, and then along the railroad tracks, it's just wonderful to look down that sort of green corridor and just kind of see these tracks going off to the far distance, which is one of the romantic feelings that everyone always associates with train travel. Um, you've done a great job of creating outdoor gathering spaces with the outdoor seating. I, I came through town about a month ago, and um, unfortunately, it was too early in the morning for anyone to be sitting. Um, 
having uh, having lunch at these places, but you can see that that has a real potential to uh, liven up the downtown, and I'm sure that these are favorite places to sit. There's a sense of enclosure that comes from those two um, multi-story buildings along either side of, of the street that give you a sense, okay, I am inside of this outdoor living room, and this is also a sense, gives you a sense of the identity of, of downtown Randolph. And this is why it was so important to replace that building in the early 1990s, because without, there's just a great big hole there, and sometimes towns, when they have a fire like this, they, they say, oh great, we can have a little park in there, and it's never quite um, functions the same way as if you have a building wall along that street, which gives you that sense of enclosure. And then there's some streets where there's not so much enclosure, and you can sort of see the contrast between these side streets, the front of Rite Aid, and then the, um, the side street down to the police station. Things kind of sort of bleed out, and you don't really get that strong sense of an edge. And then you've gone, I can tell that you've gone to um, an effort to make pedestrians feel comfortable downtown. I mean, you have this great um, sense of the <coughs> sidewalk is up a little bit higher than the street, which gives you, there's almost a little sense of theater that you're up on a stage looking down on the other side of the street. And it also raises you up above the level of the cars. And um, I guess I can't point with this, but You've also done a good job of, of marking the crosswalks. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that that presents a, a challenge for wheelchairs, and I didn't happen to notice how you've addressed that, but, but that raising up a couple steps is really kind of a nice design feature that you have inherited from another, another era. And then um, pulling out the sidewalk with those bump outs is really helpful in terms of narrowing the distance that people have to cross the street. So I felt entirely comfortable uh, walking around Randolph as a pedestrian. So you should congratulate yourselves on doing a nice job with um, pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and then there are institutions that, that will bring people into town. Oftentimes in a village, you guys are lucky to have the, the Chandler Center. I don't know what the relationship is like, but it seems like a wonderful um, institution with a great history and a, a wonderful physical presence downtown. Um, th this is a reason for people to come. I, I attended a concert here a couple years ago, and everyone spilled out, and the big question was, who's gonna to get to the restaurant first to get the available tables, and then every, all, everyone else like us had to drive somewhere else, but it's just an influx of people that you can definitely um, take advantage of. Um, and then the hospital up on the hill, uh, uh, it's only a nine minute walk from that, from the, from that um, campus down to the town. Um, if you walk it directly, there might be a nicer walk through, uh, through the neighborhoods, but that's a real opportunity. And for, for the people that work there, for the people that visit there, they should be doing that walk. Um, if the hospital, it's a healthcare place, I would think that they would encourage walking, encourage going out on a break at lunchtime and going into town to get your lunch. Um, so there's a real opportunity to, to maybe make one of those corridors um, improve it so that that connection between those two, that, between that institution and downtown is much more visible and much more uh, in people's minds. And then um, you should never underestimate the power of an electric car charging station. I was really happy to see that in addition to the one up by the interstate, there's going to be one downtown. I have had an electric car for the last six years, and I can tell you this Manchester, Vermont station, which is on between my house and, and my, my family in Berkshire County in Massachusetts, I have spent more money in the village of Manchester, you know, at the taco place, at the bookstore, at the Thai restaurant, and all the shops there. It's an incredible economic development tool because unlike filling up your car with gas, you are stuck somewhere for almost an hour, you know, and, and you want to take a walk, and you don't want to just walk around the convenience store eating your bag of chips for, for about an hour. And unfortunately, that's where most of these places are getting put. So I don't know who's responsible for this one downtown Randolph, but I think you're going to find that it's, it's, it's a great thing to have. And so will the travelers that are <laughs> going across the state of Vermont. Um, and then, of course, the train, which is a really wonderful uh, romantic presence, and people love the train. Um, it's got some limitations in that it only comes through in one direction one day and the other direction the other day. So you're not exactly going to get a lot of day trippers 
on the train, although we did take our um, two-year-old granddaughter on the train from Burlington to Virgins on a wonderful outing one summer day. <laughs> so there is a potential to do that. But, but, but the great thing about the train is it just drops people from far away right into your downtown. And, and, and I was happy to see that you've got this great bus system that I don't know if there's a connection there between the train drop-off and the bus pickup, but um, there's potential to really make those two things work together. And I was really um, also impressed to see that your, your regional transit system, I don't know how regular it is, it might not be that regular, but it's pretty extensive. You can really go far on a bus, and, um, and that just really helps to have that kind of infrastructure existing in place, and it, it's deserving of a lot of support. So what I usually talk about is walkability. How do you make places more walkable? And the, one of the first things I say is it's, it's not about the sidewalk. If you take these people that are standing on the sidewalk out of downtown Middlebury and you put them somewhere else, you would realize there's really no reason for them to be there. They need to have a reason to be there. There's a sidewalk and it's perfectly smooth and it's perfectly safe, but that's not why they're there. It's, it's what's around the sidewalk that really matters. It's that, it's that beautiful architecture that they're standing next to that will catch the sun on a warm spring day it, that invites them to stay and chat with someone they run into. It's the bank, it's the library, it's the, it's the bookstore, all of those things along Main Street in Middlebury that will bring people there. And then the sidewalk makes it possible for them to walk down the street, but it's all the other things to make it the reason for them to be there. <coughs> So there's been a lot of research on what makes a place walkable in the truest sense, um, not just safe for pedestrians, but a place where people can live without a car comfortably, can have a high quality of life, um, and can, can um, live in a place where walking is the primary mode of transportation. And these are the characteristics. They've got different names. Um, proximity is really about being close to where you need to go every day. Connections, you want to be able to walk without crossing a six-lane road or making great big detour around a river. Um, you want to have lots of different things, a balance of uses, residents next to businesses, next to civic uh, institutions. It needs to design, be designed well for people to feel comfortable in it. Um, and I, I usually call this scarcity, parking scarcity, but that usually uh, really freaks people out. So uh, it's really about just enough parking. You don't want to have any more than you absolutely need for people to, to use a car when they have to use a car. Um, and then density is a really important thing. And I think that in Randolph, you've got, you've got three of them, but there are three that you really could um, develop a little bit more if you want to make your place, your, your, your community more walkable. Because what you want is you want more destinations to walk to, you want more things to do and things to buy, um, and you want more people that are living downtown so that they can support all these activities, they can support the businesses, and they can um, participate in the life of the community. And I, I found this wish list of uh, activities on, on your website, just things that people would love to see downtown. Um, and it's a great it's a great list, and I think you might have already acquired some of those since 2018. Um, but, but I think this sort of speaks to this idea of, you know, we just want to have more things that we can do in our beloved downtown. Um, so we've been hearing on the news that Rite Aid is going bankrupt. I don't know uh, how everyone feels about this building here, but I see this as a great opportunity to um, have a whole lot more for your downtown. And um, it would be a shame to lose a pharmacy, but there could be a building there with a pharmacy in it and many other things in the building. So I'm gonna talk about um, infill in Vermont. And first I'm gonna pause and talk about the first time I came to Randolph. It was in 1993, it's 30 years ago. And, and that's me with my brown hair and youthful looking face and, and youthful idealism because what I was trying to do was to um, show, um, at the time it was really only sprawl development. Everything was built outside of town in a very automobile centric pattern. And I wanted to just show, hey, we can build in our village centers and we can do it in a way that fits the character of those places. So I studied village patterns and I chose four communities and I came, I put out a query on the planner's website whatever it was at the time, listserv, 
And the planner in Randolph contacted me and said, we'd like to be one of your case studies community. So I use this neighborhood just south of the railroad tracks as a as a demonstration of how you could put some accessory dwelling units, you could put some, subdivide some of those larger lots and add more houses so that you have more people living in a downtown. And I thought, great, people are going to see this and then this is all going to start happening because it's such a great idea. And I had absolutely no idea um, how huge the obstacles to this kind of infill development was. There was no market for it. There was regulations against it. All of the powers that be, it's just not the way they do business. Um, so I've noticed that things have started to change. And I did a little research to find out, well, how much infill has there been going on in downtowns in the last 30 years? And I couldn't find any data, so I just kind of made my own highly intuitive, highly uns unscientific chart that showed that in 1993, there was hardly any, and now there's a lot. And some point, <laughs> some point in the last 30 years, things just, just spiked upwards. And it's just been a convergence of, of um, factors, which is that people are tired of driving everywhere. There's just been a real hard work done on doing downtown development and revitalizations. There are tons of nonprofit organizations in the state, and there are all sorts of state policies now that support development downtown. And we've had, you know, politicians who, who embrace this, governors and, and state legislators who embrace, it, embrace this idea. And I'm happy to report that it's really happening out there now. And I'm just going to give you a sampling of recent infill development, and some of them are in really small towns like Lindenville and Bellows Falls, and and um, and 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 there's there's just stuff going on at different scales in different sized communities: uh, apartments, commercial, uh, affordable housing, market rate housing, renovation of historic structures, and um, and then up to the scale of, of urban city mixed-use commercial like, like the one in Barrie and Montpelier. Um, in Morrisville, which is, I guess, about the same size as Randolph, 5,000-something uh, people, uh, there's been 120 new homes built within the village in the, since, since, I think, about 2012. And that's, that's really impressive because we got a housing crisis uh, going on, and which helps because people understand the need for it. Um, but, but this is a town that just said, we need this. We want housing to go in downtown, not out in the farm fields. So they've got a very supportive town government. They have written, rewritten their regulations to encourage this. Um, they've got a very active net housing nonprofit that has become a, a partner to private developers. And then they have this uh, ambitious local developer who was a professional hockey player born in Vermont and came back to the state and decided he was going to be a developer. I think this might be his hometown. And he has built a lot of this housing and partnered with, with the Lamoille Housing Trust to make it m much of it affordable. And it's truly, it's truly a great, impressive story about what is possible to solve the housing, pro housing um, crisis. So, so let's move down to Brattleboro in the southwest corner of the state. In, this is just a one great project that happened. Uh, this is a big parking lot as it looked in 2008 and the same location in 2017. And this is, uh, the, the land was owned by the Brattleboro Food Co-op co and instead of just building, remaking their building on that site larger, they decided we're going to make a real urban mixed-use building. So they, they ended up with ground floor grocery store, offices on the next floor, and then two floors of apartments. And it's really quite a wonderful, beautiful building and center of activity that really enlivens this part of downtown Brattleboro. Um, and along with this, here's the, uh, the new building. As part of this project, across the whetstone brick, they built a little pedestrian footbridge so that you could get to this. You could link the co-op parking lot with the municipal parking lot on the other side of the river and then link to um, that part of downtown. So this is Bennington, 
uh, on the other side of the state, in the southern part. Um, this is uh, the Putnam Block, which was built in the 1880s. And in 2014, it was mostly empty upstairs. A lot of the storefronts were also empty. There were a few businesses kind of struggling. The building was a bit dilapidated. And um, this consortium of local individuals and institutions got together and said, we're going to just buy the whole block and redo the whole thing. They were incredibly ambitious. And, you know, the bank, the local bank, the medical center, Bennington College, uh, one of the larger industries in town, and several civic-minded people got together and formed the Bell Bennington Redevelopment Group. And, and they ended up building this with 17 funding sources um, and tapped lots of grants. They, 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 um, they borrowed, they got equity, and they, and they just turned over every rug for every grant they could possibly get. And in 2002, and this has got it through the, the pandemic, which is also a feat in itself, um, in 2022, ended up with 31 new apartments right in town, conveniently located, um, bookstore, coffee shop, restaurant, and a pet supply store. So now they're going to the other side of the block. They got the ones on the right done, and they're working on the part within the red boundary and uh, adding 60 more apartments and uh, ground floor retail, medical <laughs> office, urgent care center, and a fitness, uh, fitness center. This is, you know, it might not be that, but it'll be some kind of combination of those uses. Um, and the and the and the the, the, afford, the housing in the first phase was all affordable. Housing in the second phase is going to be more market rate with some affordable mixed in. And so the really important thing is just to get this mix of income. So it's not all people of one one income level. So and I'm going to talk about three railroad towns. If you go along the the railroad corridor, there are, you guys have some sister or brother towns that have been doing great things. Uh, the first is White River Junction, um, which was struggling for so long. Um, and they had these storefronts downtown that were empty and they've decided to make them as incubator spaces. So they, for low rents, they got cooperatives of artists to come in. And I think maybe you, people here know about it because I saw them. I saw this listed in your wish list of something like this downtown. But they've been doing a good job of just luring in businesses like the Tucker Box um, and making it more of a happening place to invite investment. And of course, they have the train as well. It's a little closer to New York City. and. They're starting to get people that live in Vermont but want to be able to go down to New York very, very easily, especially retired people. Um, this is the downtown, very, very compact. And what that means is that the, the opportunities for redevelopment are pretty small. The lots are really tiny. Here's, the, I don't know if you've been there, but the Polka Dot Restaurant, long time establishment, has got this parcel right behind it. And now it's got this modern, um, three-story, four-story apartment building, um, and now it's a Thai Vietnamese restaurant, really sticking with the times there. Um, and then other apartment building just on the other side of the tracks. And it's drawing a much more um, kind of urban crowd that kind of likes that connection to Dartmouth, likes that collection, connection to uh, White River, um, um, New York City, so the, there's a synergy between this Northern Stage Company, which is a, a cultural institution, and the and the um, folks that are mostly empty nesters, or maybe that's an assisted living place. I think it is actually is, yeah, that are that are locating next to that. So you get you get these you know infill opportunities, this new population. Also, the Center for Cartoon Studies is there, so it's kind of like this really interesting balance of, of cultures there in a place that is extremely intimate and walkable. And here's the, each dot represents a place that's been either redeveloped or, um, or constructed. And then Essex Junction, another railroad town, um, up in Chittenden County, uh, I worked on a project there about 10 years ago to help them develop a vision for the Five Corners area, which was had its heyday in the during the railroad era, 
and probably started declining in the in the 30s, even though IBM is on the outside of town. The downtown was really pretty much uh, emptying out. So we did this whole uh, uh, design process with the public and came up with um, just this series of conceptual images of how they could put n more buildings in their in their downtown area. So there's existing and then just showed where you can put infill buildings. Now this was in 2015. And the the difference has been remarkable. They have just really made a lot of this happen. Usually when I do a plan like that, I just sort of think, well, you know, that was that, that was a nice job. And uh, it usually just doesn't ever happen. And, and I just am shocked every time I go to Essex Junction to see, you know, what new thing has gone in on the ground. And they are really capitalizing on the high cost of housing in Burlington. People see Essex Junction as a very walkable, affordable alternative to Burlington neighborhoods. So they're getting tons of people that are interested in moving there. Um, here's another before and after of a of one of the routes right into the village. And another. I mean, we did these visual preference surveys, and people were, you know, would say they don't want to see the image on the top. They w they don't want to see lots of parking lots. What they would like to see is is buildings and 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 restaurants and shops. And one of their biggest challenges is traffic. You know, how do you how do you build something nice when you've got tens of thousands of vehicles going through your 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 town center on a regular basis? And um, what they have done is is built or they're building right now this little connector, the image on the right, shows how they can divert some of that traffic that's coming from the south uh, away from the five corners and build something much more pedestrian friendly up here. And one of the great benefits to that is then it opens this up as a new street with development potential there. And then there's St. Albans, which doesn't have the benefit of being in the Chittenden County economic engine, um, they have really had to make their own opportunities, make their own magic up there, and they've done a fantastic job. This is, uh, this is the downtown, another town that was built in the rural, r railroad era, bigger than, than Randolph, um, but has the same kind of large lots and kind of gracious feel that that era, that that era embodied. Um, but one of the th really important things that they did was to develop a downtown master plan. And, you know, they had more resources, a bigger town, they had professional people on staff, and they, and they hired a consultant to do this. But it's become a really invaluable tool because it just looks at every single property downtown and says, okay, what's existing? Where can we put a new building? Where can we renovate the facades? Where should we make the investments when we get a grant? what's the most important thing to do with that money. They became very strategic about it. Where are the parking areas? How can we share those so that we don't have to keep building more parking? Where is there a place where building a structure would actually make sense? And they actually counted all of the, the, the square footage, the new development opportunities. How much could they, they get? So they were very kind of data driven about it. And, um, it's really happening. They're, they have a lot of, of buildings have, have kind of sprung up in this town in the last, in the last 10 years. And um, here are four underdeveloped sites in St. Albans probably five years ago. And this is what's there today. And, you know, you might think, oh, there's so more urban and that's not what we're about. And sure, people do have that response that it's changing and it looks more like a city. But for the people that get to live there, the people that, the empty nesters that want an apartment, the people that can't afford to drive very far, the people that want to work in a place that's close to where they live, it's wonderful. And, and the city is really celebrating its successes. And they're not stopping there. Like they have built a lot of affordable housing that what they really want to do now is, is do uh, middle, missing middle housing, which is housing that is in their region at 62,000 and 93,000 a year. Um, and it's probably 80 to 120% of the area median income. So it's not what we think of usually as affordable housing. It's the people that, don't have enough to really buy in the market, but are not, are too wealthy to 
qualify for the affordable stuff. It's a huge problem. I don't know if it is here in Randolph, but it's most of the most of the country. It's a big problem. It's a gap. Um, and that's what they are looking at right now. They have a TIF district, and before it expires um, in the spring, they want to try to make something happen, happen with this TIF money. So that's kind of the real big investment stuff. There are also these temporary short-term strategies that you can use to generate interest in your downtown just to kind of get people down there, celebrate the place, imagine the possibilities. And, and one is just to activate a space with just a weekend of events. And this was, a, this was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Um, this group called Better Block will come in and they'll just kind of paint the sidewalks and put up cones. And, and they were trying to kind of get people interested in this beautiful historic fire station, which had, was kind of falling apart and no one seemed no one seemed aware of how they could do something with it. And they just wanted to bring people in there, see how nice it was. So they set up a weekend of you know, activities in there. It just generated a lot of interest in that building and that place. You might be familiar with the Better Block pop-up that happened in Bethel about 10 years ago. And uh, the same folks came in and they just kind of showed, okay, here's your downtown as it looked at the existing. And you know, you could just do some simple things there to kind of make it look a whole lot better, just to kind of get the ball rolling. And they did the same uh, demonstration project there. And, and the wonderful thing about this <coughs> effort is that so many people come together to work on it and make it happen, that they meet each other, they share ideas, and then they, that's the germ for them to kind of carry these ideas forward. And a lot of the things that happened in Bethel during this Better Block event are, are really come to life. Um, food trucks can turn into brick and mortar businesses is what happened in Essex Junction. When I did that work, um, I said, you know, food trucks are great. You should, you should think about filling in those empty lots. So they got this food truck for that empty lot. And, and one of those infill buildings, that business moved into the coffee shop, so you don't have to sit outside in the cold with your cup of coffee all year long. And people that take the train always go to the coffee shop before they get on the train in the morning. And then open air markets, you probably have a farmer's market here, do you? I mean, it's kind of obvious to see that that's a great way to get people to come out to um, support farmers, um, but it's also a way to support artists. Um, you, you start with a, with a stall, and then people know your work, they get uh, familiar with you, and then you develop a following, and then before you know it, you've, you're on your way as a business. And then there's just great ways to build community. The, the village of Craftsbury, tiny little town in the Northeast Kingdom, every year, the 4th of July, they close, they close the street, even though you gotta go far around <laughs> to, it's kind of inconvenient, they don't care because this is the town's day and they pull out picnic tables and ping pong tables and barbecues and everyone just kind of sits and has a great time together. The, the local store and the local farm support um, donate free food for everybody. And it's just a wonderful way to just connect with each other and build that sense of community without spending hardly any money. So I think um, in conclusion, the things that really matter is that to do village housing, it takes a village. When you, when I was doing research to find images of a lot of this infill housing, you see so many pictures like this of the ribbon cutting. And there's just tons of people at these ribbon cuttings. And these are the people that showed up for that day. And it just shows you how many people it takes to make this happen. It does, it's not like a developer getting an option on a place and then just kind of by him or herself making it happen. It's just lots of players. Um, there's almost always a public-private partnership, and that means committed town leadership, and usually a local nonprofit. Um, local institutions are almost always behind these projects, um, and they either add their financial support or they, they could become a tenant in whatever gets built to help support that especially commercial space, which is always hard to fill. Um, and then um, you're always going to need additional funding sources. There's, the market is not really there yet to do this kind of development without any help at all. But thankfully in Vermont, there's all sorts of help from the state 
and there are many, many programs that you can, you can tap into. And um, Vermont nonprofits have become absolutely expert at tapping into new market tax credits and low, in low income housing tax credits. There's no shortage of expertise around in how to do that. Um, so back to downtown St. Albans, I think the lesson there is they had a long-term plan and they had this idea of this is where we want to end up. Everyone could see it. Everyone's on board. Not everyone, always. There's always some resistance, but there's some consensus around what we want to do, what we want to do first, what are the most important things. And then they have committed partners. There's, in order to do those buildings that I showed you, they, they had a TIF district. And, and it was very successful because they had the city behind them, a local development, the Champlain Housing Trust, which is a great institution in that part of the state, uh, the, the local hospital, and then the community college. Those are really wonderful partners, and they were all working together, and they tapped these sources of funding that made it happen. Um, and the really wonderful economic story out of that is that since that TIF district was started in 2012, they've, they've added $70 million to the grant list, which as anyone, any government official will tell you, that's, that's a pretty wonderful thing to celebrate. Um, and the other thing is it takes a lot of time. These are the headlines from Vermont Digger on that Bennington project that just kind of went on and on because it was complicated and it needed support. And there was just kind of this, it was kind of a saga, but the people that were doing it, they just never, they just never took their eye off the ball and they just kept, kept at it. These are the headlines just between 2016 and 2019. But it tells a story of how long it takes, but it's worth it. Um, so what's the vision? Where, what do we want it to look like? What do we care about? What are our values? What would make downtown Randolph a whole lot better? You've done some of that work. People have been talking about what they want. I think it would be helpful to start making some, a drawn plan, counting up where the opportunities are, where are the properties that you could infill, talking of, starting to have conversations with some of those landowners. Are they interested in doing something like this? Um, and then, you know, what, what's the plan? Um, where can we add stuff? Making a map, um, counting up the square footage, just like St. Albans did. Um, and then what's the strategy? Who are we going to partner with? What, what are the funding tools that we can take advantage with? So it's not, it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> and I hope I didn't bum you out with this uh, long uh, uh, um, story of, of all of the the difficulties, but it is absolutely worth it. And I hope, I wish you the best of luck, and I hope that you can take on this challenge and do it with a, with a, with a committed community and full hearts. Thank you. And I have no idea when I started or how long I took, but I'm happy to take questions or have a, have a conversation. Anybody? <laughs> yes. You don't mention the need for good landscaping along with the buildings, and I think that's very important. It is very important, and I'm, and I'm sorry I didn't mention it, and I feel ashamed I didn't because I'm a landscape architect. <laughs> that's what I have my master's degree in. Um, yeah, it's interesting. We, we used to do... Um, uh, workshops on visualizing density. I think I think um, Julie referred to one that I did in the area, and basically we gave people images of of neighborhoods, and we asked them to just describe their gut reaction to these places. And we had pictures of neighborhoods all over the country, different density levels, and it was amazing how the the ones that everybody liked were always the same whether we did this in Phoenix or St. Johnsbury or New York City or Chicago, everyone loved the pictures with the big trees. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that's so innate in us as human beings. And if you ask people what's important, they'll tell you. They don't even need to 
federal preference survey to tell you that, but, but it's the thing that almost always gets cut from the budget at the end because it's the thing that can get cut and without someone complaining too much. But I think that having requirements that people plant street trees is really important because if you can get some good street trees in there, that goes a long way. It might take a while, but once you establish a canopy overhead, then you get that sense of enclosure, you get the shade, you get the birds, you get all those wonderful um, attributes that we know and love about trees. But you gotta, you gotta plant them and you have to plant them right and you have to require that they get planted. Lower levels, shrubs, flowers, that's all wonderful. But I do find that communities will often plant flowers when they should be planting trees because oftentimes you need something really big. And I, I can't tell you how many roundabouts that have been built with you know swirling tack, uh, traffic and there's like six little tulips are in the, in the center and nobody's seeing the tulips. Um, but yet they're almost always put in that situation. So it's an issue of scale, you know, just go for the biggest bang for the buck you can get, which is usually trees. And also ecological function trees provide the best bang for the buck. I could go on and on about trees, but I won't. <laughs> yes? So you've seen like a lot of redevelopment around the state and revitalization of communities, um, and you acknowledge how long it takes and the process that goes into it. A few years ago, we went through a uh, revitalization program called R3 here in Randolph with um, Council on Rural Development, Paul and John Copans came in and worked with our community and it kind of lost some steam due to the pandemic. Yeah. And I guess what I'm asking is, in your experience going from these different communities, what do you see as the biggest barrier to getting continuity and getting a town plan moving in the right direction? And what do you see as the as the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit to solving that? Is it, is the issue permitting? Is it, the, is the issue uh, ideological politics? Is it, uh... it? It depends on the community. It just varies. Every community has their challenge. And sometimes um, you just don't have good political leadership and you got people volunteering and wanting things to happen and the mayor or whatever just doesn't care about it. And I have found that that is the most difficult thing. Until a change of leadership comes in, it's really hard to, to get things past a certain point because you really need the local government support. Sometimes the, it's a NIMBY problem and you've got a population and often it's wealthier communities that have a lot to lose that, that will say, no, 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 this is, we like things just the way they are and we don't want anything to change. They won't, won't say they don't want anything to change, but they will just put on the brakes in many different ways or come up with lots of reasons why it shouldn't happen that don't have anything to do with the actual reason. I think nimbyism is probably one of the biggest issues. And then there's also just like a resource issue, like with really small towns, they just, if they don't have any professional staff at the town government, then it's just harder to, um, to get things going. And that's where the Regional Planning Commission um, expertise really helps the folks at the state, you know, tap into those resources as much as possible. And, um, and nonprofits, especially housing nonprofits, they're just so good at what they do. And I, I can't think of a bad one in the state of Vermont. You know, some are accomplishing more than others, but they're all, you know, pretty skilled. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's kind of resources to pay for expertise. Like, it's hard to do a plan, like I showed you from St. Albans, just with a bunch of volunteers. So if you can scrape together some money through grants to hire a consultant to do that, it's really helpful. Because once you've got that plan, which is what they had in Essex Junction, what they had in St. Albans, then it's just so much easier to just rally interest and excitement because you're all looking at the same thing, saying, this, is, this thing came up on the market and that's on our map. We've talked about this, let's make that happen so you can kind of focus 
your energy. But yeah, I mean, every, every if community, I found that towns are like, are like people. They all have their own personalities and they all have their own dysfunctional aspects. And um, sometimes I go into a town, I think, I don't think you guys need an urban planner. You need a therapist. <laughs> because nobody's really talking to each other and you've got one so group on one side and, and it's just like, I wasn't really trained for this. Um, but but that's, that's a rare exception. You could use that observation in the House of Representatives. No, oh, I'm sure. I was talking to my son who, uh, who was uh, talking about projects he's, he's done at work and, and he said it's, it's, you know, it's a problem because we go down the, the, uh, into a rabbit hole with this group and then we get to a dead end. I said, well, that's like when you were a scientist and you were doing experiments. He said, no, no, people are way more complicated. They make it much more difficult. <laughs> I'd like to... Um just make a comment as a counterpoint to Sam. I mean, he, he talked about the R3 effort losing energy, and I wasn't as involved in it as, as Sam was, I'm sure, but, you know, I think one of the things you mentioned is time frame, or the, the amount of time these things take. You know, if we look at the things that came up in R3, we've got a hotel being constructed outside of town right now. Mm -hmm. We've got a child care center. These are both things that came out of R3. Mm -hmm. We've got the, the First Fridays that came out of R3. We've got Belmains, which has been developed. A lot of those ideas and, and impetus came out of R3, and I think that, that it, has been, it has been and is being a success. It's just taking time. Mm -hmm. Time and energy and persistence by a lot of people. Sam included. I mean, the, you, his own decision. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I appreciate the counterpoint. I, that's yeah. it's a great it's a great point, and I think we are one of these interesting communities that has a ton of assets and is finding a way forward. And it's a and it's an ex another example of one that takes time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate. Okay. That. Yeah, I mean, as long as you know, you know that you're still moving forward. You know that you're you're not just stalled out or saying you know well it's going to take a long time and stop trying you know you just have to keep keep turning over stones. Okay. Yes. I, I, this is more of a comment or an observation than than anything else from somebody who, in my retirement years after thirty years in the nonprofit sector, has returned to my roots in journalism. Uh -huh. There's an institution that needs to be a vital partner in this kind of work moving forward. This country is losing 100 weekly newspapers a week um, to the internet, to social media, to, and um, you know, thankfully we have a vital weekly newspaper here in Randall. Oh, that's great. Randall. for the Vermont Standard in Woodstock, uh -huh. uh, which is on very shaky financial grounds right now. As our, and, uh, and I noticed in your presentation, um, coverage from the St. Albans Messenger, the Addison Independent, yep. the Bennington Banner, mm -hmm. the Valbar Reformer. Yeah, and I, th um, I, th I think those articles in the Digger were from the Bennington Banner. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and uh, those are vital institutions that we need to preserve as a community because they're gathering places there are conveners for the kind of discussions we need to have. And I just want to put that yeah, out there absolutely. to people. I completely agree with you. And, and you know, there, there's also the, it's really telling people, not only just giving information on projects, but telling stories. Like, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest um, ways to fight nimbyism is to just tell the stories of people mm -hmm. that need housing, that don't have housing, that recently acquired housing, how their life changed. And when that story is told, I think people's empathy goes way up mm -hmm. and, and um, sense of fear comes down because a lot of um, fighting of development is really just fear of change. So I think in, in such situations where the press has really grabbed that topic of, of the housing crisis and told the story from many different yeah. dimensions, it's been extremely helpful. I mean, there is this perception in many communities that building affordable housing is going to bring undesirable elements into town. Yeah. Right? 
I, you know, I hear that a lot. We yeah. hear that a lot. Right. And, uh, and usually the people that are saying that are would themselves qualify for the affordable housing that they're talking about yeah. <laughs> because everybody needs affordable housing yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, there, you know, there's lots of, um, lots of embedded bias, biases that we have all kind of grown up with and we're exposed to through the media, racist and uh, classist that we are sus suspect to. So continually being um, exposed to people's stories really helps us overcome that. Yes. Just a quick, uh, you know, we, we compete a little bit with the interstate, okay? Yes. Modes of transportation <laughs> yeah. with the uh, trains was lovely because people had to stop and stay. But when you got people going by 70 miles an hour, how do you, you know, benefit community-wise to get some of that traffic into downtown? So, I mean, is there thoughts on other communities that are in that kind of situation as well? Yeah, it's interesting. I did a project for the state of Vermont 15, maybe 20 years ago about how to get, how to deal with development at interstate interchanges. How do you, to, um, not do the stuff that, build the stuff that should go downtown, balance the needs of the travelers with economic, downtown economic development. And at the time there was a lot of talk about signage and we didn't realize that the internet was about to show up and make that all <coughs> obsolete. So I think that probably social media is a really good tool in your arsenal. You know, travelers really rely on Yelp and Google ratings to kind of steer people to destinations because if something is rated really high, that's gonna it's gonna get make people do detours. Um, I think that the the um, you're it's a challenge because you're far enough away from the interstate that it's not you got to kind of make a commitment. In an electric car, you're gonna you're going downhill and you got to say I was coming down saying today saying well if you don't have much charge left. I really hope that chargers open because I'm not going to get back up that hill. <laughs> um, but I think that I think that it just getting the word out to people in non-conventional ways about what you got going on there, and using the press and buzz so that people will. You, and maybe you won't get the casual people that are driving from Boston to Montreal because they're going too far, they don't want to make that big a detour. But you could get a lot of Vermonters that will say, I'm going to go down Route 12 because Randolph's got a lot going on and we're going to have lunch there. Um, but get on the radar of like seven days and you know anyone that's kind of shaping tastes about what's happening where. I, you know, good, a good, um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the Northeast Kingdom, and I got to say, Hill Farmstead Brewery, <laughs> I don't know whether you know about it, but you go into their parking lot in the middle of nowhere, and there is no Vermont license plate. These are people from all over the country that have decided that they have got to taste this beer. Yeah. So whatever kind of marketing magic they are using, it really works. I guess they rely on scarcity, so people, it's hard to get. Yeah, you can't go wrong with beer. <laughs> yes. You didn't say much about programming, but I think it's important for a town like Randolph and most others to have a kind of a theme or a goal that's much bigger than any individual building or housing mm -hmm. plan. And it, Randolph, for example, the, as the Chandler Center for the Arts, as a which is a regional art center, really, and a regional hospital, and as evolving restaurants, which become a, a theme too. But internally, if people making plans can agree on what to build, what to support, I think comes out much better, especially when it comes to promoting the town outside the town. Mm -hmm. So that That's consensus true. of the people that this is what we're going to give our focus to. Right, and there, and I thought you were going to say programming around like 
having festivals, having having events that draw people from a broader region, region or state. I mean, that has been the formula in Burlington. There, I when I first moved there thirty something years ago, there were no, there was much, there was a they just started the marathon that year, and now like between the middle of May till the end of October, there is something every weekend of, of beer festival, food tasting, jazz festival, just like they just keep coming up with more of them. And as a matter of fact, they had a, they had a, a slogan contest in Burlington. <laughs> and one of the, one of the entries was, uh, yeah, we got a festival for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's just, it's just so invaluable to um, get people into town. I mean, it's frustrating if you live there, you can never get a table in a restaurant because there's always something going on. Um, but as a taxpayer, I'm like, yeah, this is great. Um, but uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, there, there are different scales that you can do that at, but so it's not that you can start, you know, smaller. And if it works, you know, just kind of build it up and invite more and more people. Music, festivals are, you know, outdoors, you can have more people. Um, whatever it is that, I guess you guys have a lot of goats here or something, is that what I read in the... We got goats. Yeah, all right, so a goat theme, something, you know, whatever it is that makes you unique. That well, we have the New World Festival, which draws people from all over yeah. the East. So you're already doing a festival. Yeah. 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 In Celtic and Quebec music. Great. That's wonderful. And so how many people do you get to come to that? 12, 1,500 yeah, for a, a one has, day. Nice. Yeah. And so great spillover to town businesses for mm -hmm. that one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've and, also and, started becoming a, um, and I, I understand it's a kind of a resurgence of uh, this, but we've started becoming a mountain biking mecca mm -hmm. as well. Wow. Uh, and have a very active uh, trail development system regionally that is the hub for which is here in Randall. I think that you should think about train visitors and marketing these activities to the yeah. people oh, yeah. that I'm could, down. you know, in up and down the Upper Valley, I mean, the, sorry, the Pioneer Valley and into New York City to just offer this as an option. You know, you come do a weekend and your bike is ready for you at the at the station. Here are the places you can stay and we've got this other thing going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a great untapped potential. Because what you want, I mean, I've, I ride the train. My husband and I travel more on trains across the country than we do in airplanes. And the biggest challenge is what's available when you step off the train and you're in this place that some places have good um, car rental or bike rental or hotels nearby and other places it's terrible and you, you know you often decide where am I going to where am I going to get off the train and it often has to do with what sort of visitor amenities they're offering there that you can find out about and look attractive to you so I, I would really dig into that possibility and find ways to get the word out yeah um, I think to mention the hotel is is coming about that's at the interchange. But how how important do you think we we really we have lost all of our <coughs> not at the interchange um, short term <laughs> rental except Airbnb and even that after COVID is pretty limited. So I wonder like in a downtown like we're we're starting to look at what we could do for short you know for visitor. Um, yeah. Oh, so there is, really is, isn't yeah. a place to stay. No, no, is there, are there any Airbnb? Nothing. Pretty much. Oh wow. Well, that's a missed, op that's a missed opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would think you know any property that like that right aid. I don't know what the status of it is, but if that were to get redeveloped, then some kind of hotel is part of that. Some kind of lodging. If there's nothing here, that's a great. There's no competition. That's a great uh, opportunity. Yeah, one of, one of the difficulties there is that they're just putting up a 67 unit hotel on exit four. And it's just going to be a chain hotel? Yeah. Well, it's, it's going to be a chain hotel, but it'll be a hotel at least. Right, right. But yeah. the, the point is, is, once you have one, <laughs> just justifying another one is going to be hard. 
You actually had a study. Well, we no, because it's, it's well, I mean, see. I'm not a marketing genius, but I know that it's a completely different experience what it would be down here. And this is going to be a, a residence motel, so longer term stays. It's actually a new chain that's just evolved in the last yeah, couple of years. Yeah, that's a very different there. experience than what someone would have in downtown we'll Randolph with all the, the wonderful stuff here. So we, will, we will look at that because we, um, Preservation Trust did a study for us a while back and then before COVID, which is like the end of the world, right? So. Um, so we're going to do another one again to just Yeah, I mean, well, people are traveling. It's like the airline industry is is out of control, busy. Yeah. And so people are moving around. So it doesn't seem like there's a, there would be a fear of investing in, in lodging. So if you got off that train. Yeah, you and I have, off oftentimes. Train, <laughs> right? And uh, the closest place to stay may be 30 miles away. Do you not know? In the You're going to need place? a couple of inns. You well, know, you know, then you'd need a car rental place within yeah. walking distance. Yeah. Yeah. But walk downtown. I mean, a couple of inns. You, if you, you, oftentimes you think, is this a nice little downtown experience that I would enjoy overnight? And do I want to stop and spend the night there and then get on the train the next day? Um, or is it a gateway for me to get to the ski area or get to the hiking trails that are farther away, in which case I'd want to have a hotel nearby because the train's usually late and you get there l later than you want to. Um, I'd want to be able to get my rental car without having to get an Uber or whatever. So you just put yourself in the position of someone that steps off a train, doesn't have a car. What do they want? And, and then build the infrastructure around that. It would be interesting to see as the uh, EV market broadens and the number of charging stations uh, uh, broadens so that people don't get range anxiety like you referenced to earlier, um, if EV car rental could be something that could be integrated with the, with the Amtrak station. Have mm -hmm. EV rental, have 15 uh, e-bikes there yeah. in collaboration with the bike shop here in town. And yep. you jump off the train, you jump on an e-bike, you rent a Chevy Bolt or whatever, yep. and yep. off you go. That's um, that's really good. They, they had ski towers. I moved here in 83, uh, and I noticed from the rumor there was, it was a ski area here. I mean, tiny, albeit just like, maybe like suicide, six or even smaller. But, I don't, but a lot of uh, great skiers have come from Vermont or have trained or formative years of, of getting to be uh, Olympic skiers, which we have. We've had a few of them. Uh, came out of, there was a hill actually in Lebanon. It's ridiculously small. And uh, this one's probably even bigger. And uh, what's her name? One of uh, the one who won the ones in Killington. I'm trying to remember her name right now. Michaela Schifrin. Mm -hmm. trained, on, trained on that when, when she was a teen or in her preteen years. So and I always wonder why Randolph wouldn't, I know Killington's Killington, but why Randolph couldn't have, could, they have some towers up there, up and up past Hospital Hill. I don't know why they could never redevelop that uh, into a, a small local, uh, you know, have the school children or whatever else to be able to go there as an outdoor sport. And also I think that could, we might turn out another champion's uh, skier out of this town. I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. Or snowboard, excuse me. I'm a skier, but snowboarding now. Yeah. But those towers are still there as far as I know. I'm hmm. sure that there's a way to do it again. I would also think about your sister towns along Route 12 because it's kind of a much more interesting way to come up along instead of taking the interstate. You know, there's some really nice little towns along Route 12 and just trying to kind of develop some synergy between what you can do here and what you can do there to just kind of get people to think about that as a as a much more interesting travel corridor. Yeah, I know there's a cheese trail. I'm sure there's a beer trail. Maybe there's a goat trail. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't want to bust this up, but in the interest of time, I think we need to wrap up the formal part of the meeting. But uh, I'd like to thank Julie for her great presentation. <laughs> Julia Flint say we need a, a town plan at least 500 times in the next 10 years, so we're going to have to work on that. But thank you very much, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, feel free to stay and chat a little bit. I think there's still a few little snacks in the back, but uh, thanks for being here and appreciate your support, and uh, we'll see you next year or before.
Thanks a lot. First of all, I want to thank Julie for that lovely photographic journey she took us on because I think that it makes all of us want to go see all the places you showed us. I know myself, I'm very intrigued by what you showed us and I love seeing the before and afters of those. And I just want to take one minute of your time and I feel very privileged to be able to just tell you a little bit about um, the heart of Randolph Area Community Development Corporation. And that person is Julie Ifland. She has given herself countless hours. If you've driven past the third floor of Bar Harbor building in the evenings and you see those lights on, it's not the cleaning crew. That is Julie working tirelessly to advocate for this community. And I consider it a privilege to work for her for the time that I've spent there. I've learned a great deal from her. And I've often told her, Julie, there are things I don't know. And I feel very unqualified to do some of the things I'm doing. But one of the things I feel very confident is that you know what you're doing. <laughs> and I just want to thank her. And I think that everybody tonight who has been recognized for awards and people who have been called out for the jobs they've done, our board, our staff, I believe she needs to be recognized too.